driving change with the healthcare spending benchmark, Delaware's Road to Value, a presentation by Dr. Kara Odom-Walker, Cabinet Secretary of the Department of Health and Social Services for Delaware. Our first speaker, I think she needs no introduction, but Dr. Kara Odom-Walker is the DHSS Secretary uh, and came to us at the start of the Cardi administration with a background in family medicine, but also a background in the use of data for pushing progress in healthcare. So really a great combination of, of, of the perspectives that we need to achieve the progress that we have to achieve in Delaware in coordination with, with the many, many stakeholders, so many of whom are in the room today, and we thank you very much for that. Um, both for Dr. Walker as well as for our, our two distinguished out-of-state guests, I won't go. I won't read the exact biographies that I think many of you have picked up from outside and have been flashing on the screen for quite some time. I always find at events that it's kind of funny to just read verbatim the, uh, the the biographies. But that being said, they often are carefully crafted so people understand the specific experiences of the individuals and why it's relevant that they're here. And again, I think for Dr. Walker, it's critical to have someone in this position who has both the practice experience of, of being a physician, but also the, the use of data, which we've got to find more and more ways of, of um, interjecting into healthcare decision making so we can do as good a job as possible. So on the fly, that's my version of her introduction. Uh, and, and Dr. Walker, please very much kick us off. Really excited to have everyone here today. It's a great way to start off our Monday morning with a little discussion of healthcare. And many of you, thank you, many of you have heard us talk about uh, the context for why we're taking on uh, looking at paying for care in our state in a different way, but also what are those principles that are really essential for us as a state to embrace? And there have been many conversations, which I'm looking at uh, across the room. So many of you have been part of these conversations, whether they were with our state innovation work, whether it's with the State Employee Benefits Committee, whether it's at your own local institutions. How do we pay for care and how do we organize ourselves to produce the best population health outcomes that we possibly can. You know, we, we have a tremendous opportunity and certainly as we track trends over time, we have seen many states around us take on this issue in different ways. This is our chance to own it and our chance as a state to take this on. We are uh, on Facebook Live today, so if you're on Facebook, feel free to follow uh, Delaware DHSS. If you tweet, um, feel free to tweet at Delaware underscore DHSS and use the hashtag OurHealthDE. Um, I'm gonna just share a bit about how these principles come together before we have this conversation about how we wanna create the legislative and regulatory framework to allow us to do this. Uh, we are trying to get to a place where Payment aligns with value, right? We know that in healthcare, we're paying often for visits and volume, and we're not necessarily paying for coordination or for things that we know make sense or make us healthier. We, we're trying, and there are so many places that are, that are trying to make this happen, but we certainly have not figured out how to align all of these elements yet. And so I think the road that we want to take, everyone likes having a road and some signs uh, to know if we're getting there on your trip, so we really want to get to a place where we're supporting the elements that we all think are important, right? What we want for our mom or our brother or our, you know, little ones. We want to support patient-centered and coordinated care. We want to make sure that the health workforce and the infrastructure that we have, whether it's IT infrastructure, whether there, there are actual locations, whether it's uh, telehealth, we want to make sure that infrastructure is in place so that we can support what patients really need. We also know that the little green dot, looking at uh, the health of special populations is really critical because some of those special populations, whether it's those with chronic conditions or those with disabilities, tend to drive a lot of healthcare costs and some of the outcomes that were, are less desirable. So how can we do that in a way that engages communities, engages every individual to participate in that conversation, and how do we do that in a way that is supported by both the payment and the, the uh, tools that we have to drive things into better care. We also, as the orange little dot marker says, we want data-driven performance. How do we get to a place where we know the cost of care and we also know the quality of care? That allows us to have these transparent conversations about where we're going, if we're heading in the right direction. And I think this is a really critical part why the benchmark allows us that flexibility to say, 
we want to set a target. We want to contain costs because the increasing costs in our state are really pushing out other things in our budget like education and infrastructure and other places where we really need to invest dollars and think about things differently. But certainly healthcare costs are driving that out. We've gotten to a place where we're third highest per capita cost. We know that we need a little bit more information about what does that really mean? What is driving those costs? What makes us so different and unique? And what gives us the opportunity to have a conversation around quality and cost where we're really paying for value. So we've had a lot of conversations with many of you in this room around the benchmark. The benchmark is really a framework to say we want to set a target and we want to achieve that target and cost, but underneath of it are all of these other important elements that we really need to flesh out. So this is just setting the stage and we're going to have continued conversations around what are the essential elements that we need to have beneath the benchmark that allow us to really organize that payment and that value. So I've, I've reiterated this because I think it is really important to remember why we're talking about this right now. And when you're really at a place where uh, our per capita healthcare costs are more than 25% above the US average, it's, it's time to just take a look, take a deep dive into why we're going in that direction. And many of you have seen this cost curve escalate that we expect spending to uh, double by 2025. If we don't start to change that, we really are going to be in a situation where we're back at it again every year, trying to figure out the budget, right? Trying to figure out the state's budget, trying to figure out where to make cuts. And some of those cuts are really hard. You start to think about the choices that we're making uh, year over year, and when it's a lot of it is just how we're paying for healthcare. When Delaware healthcare costs consume at least 30% of the, the state budget, we really do need to think about things in a different way. And so this is why the benchmark is important. It's a convening principle, and there are many elements that will have to be embedded in that plan, but we'll get there together. This graph, again, context, because some of you may not have seen it, although I think I show it at every one of these forums, so if you haven't seen it, then ta-da! Uh, we're that little yellow bar. We really are third highest per capita. We're only Alaska and Massachusetts are higher. And Massachusetts is making progress. So, so are we going up and they're going down? I don't know, but I think that's something we'll hear about maybe a little bit later. Um, it is just, again, this community principle that we need to think about how, how we're doing and, and where our levers are. When you think about the benchmark, I think this graphic is a nice way to depict it. If you, if you like pictures, I like pictures and numbers, but hey. We really do want to start to say, what is our target as a state? If our state's economy is growing at something like 3%, or our state revenue is growing at 2%, what do we want to use as that match? Do we want to set the target arbitrarily from another entity who says, okay, independent uh, group has said, our healthcare costs should grow at X percent. I don't know what that percent is, and that's why we've showed these different levels. But it is an, a chance for us to say, at some point, we have to just push, put that target in place, set a goal for ourselves, and see where we can work within that budget. So this is the, the essence of the healthcare benchmark, and we're going to continue to have dialogue around how do you get to those targets, those bars, those lines that you see here. We also know that when you look at overall health rankings or quality indicators, for whatever reason, we're sicker. Um, than those around us. Our population is older, it's aging faster. If you look at healthcare rankings, we tend to be sicker than many average states. We're something like 31st, according to America's health rankings. And that's a composite score that looks at many factors, includes things like racial and ethnic diversity and disparities issues that emerge, like infant mortality rates and cancer rates. But what it does remind us all is that we can do more. We can do more around population health. We can do more when we're thinking about certain high-risk populations. And this is, again, this convening principle that if we're paying a lot, maybe we can push a little bit more and try to get to a place where we're actually getting better health out of it, too. So these are the opportunities and threats that we have. We know that our state, again, is unique, as, uh, as is every state in many ways. But you know, the first state is also unique in that we purchase health care for a greater share of the population than most other states. States. And so if you start to think about state purchasing power, this term that's used to say, maybe we could use that to negotiate, maybe we could use that to design something that's particularly suited to us. 
we also know that we have made a lot of progress in learning about what it means to pay for value. And there are many examples. There are examples that people in this room, I hope, will share when we start to have the dialogue. Because we're getting there, but we have more to do. About 30% of our providers are in some kind of value-based arrangement, but we probably aren't yet um, pushing that bar forward as other places have done, it's mostly upside risk. Um, you're mostly getting a little bit back if you meet certain metrics. We probably want to get to a place where we're also having some downside risk, meaning that if you haven't met that goal, there's some kind of penalty for not achieving those uh, targets. So we might need to start thinking about what that means. How can we accelerate the pace of adoption? Is there something we can do to help people along, support that transition, uh, but also allow everyone to learn as you're uh, learning about the value? There are key objectives when we're looking about moving in this direction. And I think the essence of anything that we take on will be that we need to give Delawareans choice and information to make better healthcare decisions. So anything that we do around re, uh, reorganizing how things fit together or setting targets needs to have these principles in place. We also need to make sure that what we're doing at the neighborhood level, within institutions, within hospitals, needs to reinforce these healthy choices. And then finally, we also need to make sure that we're supporting primary care infrastructure so that allows for improvement, allows for better coordination, allows for a, a bottom tier that focuses on things like wellness and prevention because we know that those things matter and we know that that is something that's important for long-term health and outcomes. So there are several strategies I'm going to go through at a high level. The first of these strategies is, is really key. Obviously we want to talk about improving healthcare quality and cost. And this value-based framework is essential to figuring out what you do to actually pay for that care. It's also essential when you start to talk about what are the systems, whether you call them a patient-centered medical home or some kind of accountable care organization or, a, uh, or other kinds of uh, coordination models that are out there, you really need to figure out how you're putting the patient experience, quality, and cost uh, into this framework. We also want to focus on this third bullet, which is reducing unnecessary and inappropriate care. I'm a family doc. I know for sure there are lots of things that we're doing in an everyday visit that sometimes aren't evidence-based, right? You do them because they're, they're normal, they're practice culture. You just uh, reflexively have done it because of the way you train. But we also know that we're starting to get more evidence and we're starting to know a lot more about what's appropriate and what really is uh, based on sound evidence, what's based on guidelines that are out there. So if we can start to figure out how to capture that up to 50% of healthcare costs that may be waste, quote unquote, or unnecessary, maybe that is a chance for the healthcare community to come together and say, if we create these feedback loops in an ongoing way, there may be a way to capture some of that challenge that uh, every healthcare institution and every provider is facing. We also want to get to strategy two, which is paying for value, getting away for paying for a visit, paying for a stop at the emergency room, paying for an individual encounter, and getting to a place where we're talking about how you pay for the fact that someone has a better diabetes outcome than, than they used to, or how their high blood pressure is potentially lowered. One of the ways to do that is at the first step is to set this healthcare spending benchmark and then beneath it figure out how you want to actually reorient costs towards value. And that requires a lot of different levers. Some states, as you'll hear later, are thinking about how you look at managed care organization contracts, how you embed some of these thresholds, some of this value into individual contracts. Uh, but there are many models out there. Some are doing this through what we call accountable care organizations, how you pay at the larger level and then allow others to come in as subcontract subcontractors to really allow uh, paying for value to matter and to work. Because you want to share risk. You want to share the opportunity to both gain if you meet these thresholds, but you also want to be able to share the risk with those who are making decisions every day. <coughs> Strategy three is also critical. You have to support patient-centered coordinated care. We know that there's a lot of opportunity to better coordinate services. Many people come to us and say, could you just help make sure that my providers know my information? And certainly, Delaware Health Information Network has made tremendous strides and is a tremendous investment in 
making that work on a technology side, but some of it is how do we make that work in other settings? How do we make it work for that family who's struggling with addiction or that family who has someone with disabilities and their family is trying to put together all the providers who come and support them in their needs? So could we use this approach that others have said where you have all payers come together in an accountable care organization to facilitate the integration of services and create a, a foundation of patient-centered medical homes? And then can you also create some new ways to reimburse for services in safety net? I mean, we want to support our most vulnerable and we need to make sure we're paying for that in a way that is well coordinated and really focused on the right population health outcomes. Strategy four, we also need to make sure that we have the provider workforce and healthcare infrastructure needs in place. And a big part of what the federal waiver system has done in the past is allow states to say, we want to go on this pathway, can you please also throw in some money so that delivery systems can have incentives to invest in the infrastructure that's needed to actually do practice transformation, to redesign how we do our workflows. That requires money and investment and is not something we should just put on the backs of providers or systems. So we need to make sure that we're not only thinking about the long-term trajectory of our primary care workforce, particularly in a state where we don't have a medical school, we really need to figure out what does that mean. But then we also need to expand beyond just physicians. We need to think about dental care, behavioral health, and other health professionals. It's really essential to think about those other workers who make the care coordination essential, community health workers and others who are care professionals and, and really essential to making sure the healthcare team works effectively. We also have a lot changing in our state, as we've seen in other places, where we need to reflect the racial and ethnic diversity of the population at large that we're trying to serve. And those who are experiencing those disparities uh, over time are definitely, at times, the, the place where we need to uh, focus our efforts. And so if we can start to use this as a chance to invest in that racial and ethnic diversity of the workforce, and there are many efforts going on in our state right now to support that, but we need to continue pushing. We also need to prepare for the fact that our safety net providers have increased needs right now. Um, for all of you who are watching the, the federal uh, changes that potentially could come to states, whether it's this week or whenever, we all need to prepare for the fact we may have more people who are uninsured and trying to navigate systems. We need to make sure we're focusing on those opportunities to get people into care, to think about prevention and access. And maybe this is, again, this part where we need to figure out how to get people into care when, when it's needed, whether they have insurance or not. Um, we, we will certainly also need to move forward with technology, whether that's investing in telehealth, whether it's investing in phone calls or video uh, medicine. There are so many opportunities to better coordinate services and, again, invest in that technology that's needed. And then we're also doing some of this work now, but we keep pushing around investing in provider readiness. There are data analytics, there are technology needs that need to be in place for people to understand whether they're, as a provider they are actually making progress. If you're being measured for outcomes, you need to be able to, in real time, know if you're getting there or if you're way off. And so those feedback loops are really essential, but you have to have the, the investment infrastructure in place. <coughs> Strategy five. Again, we have to focus on special populations, particularly in our state, and figuring out how to strengthen that capacity and promote health equity for those with disabilities is essential. How we support families who are uh, trying to make sure that supports are aligned. Uh, we also have a huge opportunity to focus on maternal and child health, where infant mortality is a big part of our challenge as a state in health rankings. So is that, again, something that we can continue to deploy uh, evidence-based strategies like nurse home visits uh, to those who are most at risk? We also know that we're dealing with an epidemic of violence in the city of Wilmington, so can we embed these principles of trauma-informed systems of care that can also better support our, our outcomes and opportunities to integrate mental health and physical health? And then finally, again, this is, well, all of these principles are called out in in many places, but certainly in the governor's action plan, where he really called out this focus to look at prison reentry populations and how we can better support their needs. And we're trying to figure out how those transitions in care can be uh, more, more integrated from a health lens. 
So this is one additional uh, special population need. And I'm sure there are others that will emerge. And I hope that through having these uh, conversations, more of you will, will say, you know, we need to focus on this and this needs to be embedded in the overarching plan. Strategy six, engage communities. We certainly want to leverage the strengths of communities and put the decisions and the feedback loops at the community level as much as possible and improve uh, the opportunities to look at community-based wellness initiatives. Uh, even more, we want to look at population health metrics and create these data-driven approaches <coughs> to allow community health workers to have the information they need to do door-to-door -door visits or uh, community screenings or set up appointments so that people know what uh, can happen when you really engage everyone in their health care. So this is just another part of it. Much of this work is, is already existing. We just need to strengthen uh, the resources that are currently in place. Strategy seven, we need data. Uh, as you heard Senator Townsend say, we definitely, I support the need for data that we believe, that we trust, that we know is reliable, and that's a, a going to be a big investment. We already have some of the infrastructure in place, but making that real is critical. So can we use this public-private collaborative approach to establish both the quality and cost targets, decide what metrics are really important, what are the quality outcomes we all expect uh, collectively and how do we get there uh, and monitor that over time. And I think we're going to need to get to a place where any accountable care organization has a methodology that we all agree with, that, that we are, can have a common language when we're talking about quality and cost goals. Uh, what are we talking about when we have a benchmark? If we have a public hearing about these things, are we all talking about the same expectations? And can all of the payers come together with these total cost of care models that have been effective to say, bring everybody together. Uh, it, it may be a kind of stage approach, but how do you get everyone to say, we believe that this is the total cost for this type of care and how do we define that? And we also want to make sure that we're not forgetting about the exchange. And the exchange right now certainly is a, a big opportunity for us in Delaware, but we know that it, it's challenging. We don't have a lot of competition as a state. So are there ways to bring in additional strategies to strengthen the way that people get coverage in our state? And I think this is going to be really critical. Can you marry what happens in our exchange and Medicare? Can you marry what happens with these uh, accountable care organization models to make sure people have access and have a way to to, to get care across the spectrum of their lifespan. So this success re relies on everyone coming to the table. It relies on many outreach groups, many key constituents, uh, the leadership uh, capacity that we already have in the state, and the data and informatics that we already have in existence. But we're going to need to continue to push that dialogue, and we're having as many conversations as we possibly can with groups uh, I've heard very loud and clear from so many people who have said, this is important, let me know how to help, let's continue to have this dialogue. Oh, but by the way, I want the details, right? So <laughs> we'll continue to have conversations around what those details are. What will this really look like and feel like? And how does this impact everyone who's sitting around the dinner table and isn't sitting at a summit or a forum? How do we have those conversations as well? Because this is something that impacts everyone, not just those who have insurance who are paid for by the state, but it goes beyond that. And certainly employers and the economic opportunities in our state are limited when healthcare costs are skyrocketing and uh, employers are having trouble getting additional uh, insurance coverage for their employees. So this is, this is just a starting point, but we're looking forward to many more conversations. It certainly has many connected pieces. Um, our legislature goes back into session and in January. We're right now in a stage where we're in the planning and dialogue uh, process. We're looking forward to having a draft report in December about how the benchmark will work. That was called out in HJR 7. And a big part of that is how do we create some economic models? What's the governance going to look like? How do you actually set the targets? Where do you think we're going to go around uh, developing the different policy options? Because certainly there are a range of policy options that we could consider as a state. We have uh, a, a large uh, RFP out right now where we're hoping to soon have some additional consultants on board and additional expertise to help guide that economic modeling and that development. But I think
okay, this is all part of the dialogue, and we're having as many conversations about what matters to each and every person who may touch this planning process. We need to have stakeholder input. We're looking forward to people sending us comments on Facebook Live and having a public comment process to engage in ongoing conversations. And we've had many people come and say, we want to have a stakeholder group meet around certain issues, and we've heard nutrition or issues relevant to the pharmaceutical industry or issues relevant to those with chronic disease. If you know of others and those with disabilities, you certainly said loud and clear, we need to think about these issues in a unique way. So uh, I hope all of you here and all of you online will continue to say we need to have these conversations and have a way to think about what's critical and what's worked in other places and what uh, key elements and best practices could be developed here in Delaware. We're going to continue to have summits. Um, this is the third of five that have been planned so far, but there will be additional ones. Um, certainly on October 18th, we're going to have a very geeky one. This is going to be me in my world of talking about data analytics and how you look at the methodology to calculate things like cost and quality. And we could probably spend um, three days on any of these issues, but we're going to at least have an initial conversation. Uh, on November 2nd, we're going to have a dialogue about uh, governance models and you know, feature some of those models that have worked in Vermont and Massachusetts and Oregon. So I, I hope that um, if some of you can't make it in person, you will listen uh, online. We are recording all of these sessions and making sure that uh, folks can hear the speakers who come and share their expertise. Um, but please do follow along. and. And we're really looking forward to the conversation today because I think it is, again, part of how we learn about what the best approach will be for the state of Delaware. This is a great opportunity, so thank you for letting me share this.